Okay, I got a good one here I want to share with you guys. This is a 2005 Buick LaCrosse with a 3.6 liter engine. This is a dual overhead cam design, has coil over plug, ignition, and the unique part with this engine is it has four cam sensors, one crank sensor. So there's an intake cam sensor, an exhaust cam sensor on both cylinder heads, and a crank sensor. So a little bit of background knowledge on this engine. Now I want to do this one differently because I think there's some variables that I want to show which is my main focus here with this video. And I'm just going to tell you what the problem is up front. We have no compression on the back three cylinders. So cylinders one, three, and five that are on the back side have no compression. We had some trouble codes when we started with this that told us we had misfires on one, three, and five. So we had history one, three, five misfire. This was brought in on a tow truck. It does not run. It does not start. On occasion, it feels like it's going to start or sounds like it's going to start, but then for the most part, it's pretty much nothing. So rather than showing you all the normal procedures that we would go through and trying to identify our problem, I'm just going to tell you what we did. Based on the sound, I'm going to let you hear it first. So I, I guess we'll start there. Let me, let me crank it and let you listen to it. And, and you tell me what you think based on the sound and whether or not we have compression in this engine. So I'm going to go ahead and crank it. So you can hear that compression sounds pretty good with this engine. So we heard that, we brought it in, we uh, Went through the normal checks, spark, fuel compression. We weren't losing spark at all. Spark was maintained the whole time. I showed this in one of my last videos where we can check the spark of a component and visual inspection, basic tests. Really all you're doing is putting the coil in. I have this one unplugged, so if you can picture the coil in the picture and you put a, a test light and an air gap here and you look for spark, and we had spark the whole time. So that was our basic spark test. Then we checked fuel, we actually unplugged the brake booster hose, we used that as an inlet source for fuel, I didn't want to damage this mass airflow with any kind of liquid source, we used some carb clean in the brake booster line that went to the intake, did not react to fuel at all, we continued to do some other checks with fuel, I don't believe that we checked, no we did check fuel pressure, there's a Schrader valve on this design back here. Fuel pressure was good, we checked injection pulse, it was good, and again, based on the way it sounds, it sounded like it had compression. We went after plugged exhaust, removed the O2, no change, no pressure in the exhaust. So that's kind of where we were. Then we started doing our scope tests on cam crank and relative compression, and, and so our next thought in this process was that we're going to synchronize our relative compression with an ignition firing event. So let me show you the setup on that. So I'm using the Pico high amp probe and I'm connected to the main cable that goes to the starter and I'm going to read starter current and I'm going to synchronize this one in this case with one of our coils up front and the reason we're not doing one of the back coils is they're a little bit more difficult to get to so I want to show you this first step and see what you guys think. I'm going to pick one of the control wires. I've shown this before in other videos. The small base circuit square wave turn on signal. We're going to use this to synchronize with starter current and give us an idea not only compression but also where the ignition is taking place in relation to top dead center. Okay so you see my second channel I'm connected here to one control wire on this Coil, this would be cylinder number five. It doesn't matter which cylinder you pick when you're doing a timing compared to relative compression. We just want to know where this ignition event is taking place. And, and if you can think about our thought process here, we were concerned about a timing issue because everything else is looking good. We got spark, fuel, compression. We're worried about ignition time. Where is it occurring in relation to top dead center? Let's take a look. Okay, I got you guys focused up on my smart board here. We've got the Pico screen set up on it. I'm going to crank this engine over so you can see the, what the waveform looks like. So 
So what we're looking at here, the pumps on the screen would be starter current. We can throw a filter in that to clean it up a little bit. Looking at starter current and then the blue trace, we're looking at where the timing is occurring in relation to top dead center. And we really focused, I'll show you on the area that we were really looking at, we really, we didn't pay attention to the number of firing events on the screen compared to the number of humps on the screen. We really focused right away on basically where is this signal occurring? And if you remember from some of the other videos I've done, the turn off signal right here, this is where our spark is occurring. And so what we know about this vehicle is we are pretty much right dead on as far as where timing is occurring in relation to top dead center. So that's where we were. And what we said was, well actually we were we were a little bit confused at this point as to which direction to, to go next. Well, I might as well tell you, there's something else in this picture we missed. And, see, do I want to talk about that yet? Maybe come back to this? Now nah, we'll talk about it now. What we missed is that, this is my number five right here. That's where my sink is connected to. I'm looking at the turn on for the number five cylinder. So this is number five. And that means that this is the number five too. And what we missed going into this, we missed that there aren't enough humps on the screen. Sorry, that's not the number five. I don't know if I said that was the number five before or not. That is, it's, two, it's 246 on the front bank. I am connected to cylinder number six. This is cylinder number six, this is cylinder number six. And it keeps repeating itself. Now think about it, this is a V6 engine. We should have six different humps between there. From this point here to this point here is 720 degrees of crank rotation. How many compression waveforms do we see? We only see three. And this is where we went wrong. We missed it. We missed it because we weren't looking at the repetition of the firing event. We were looking simply at the area where the spark was occurring. We were focused here. We never paid attention to it. That was my fault. So I want to point this out. This is a, a good place to start. If you only were looking at the relative compression waveform here, what you would say to yourself is this vehicle has good compression and nice even uniform humps across the screen one two three four five six one two three four five and so on that's what you would say you would think your compression is good so this is a variable again to this test we need to think about some other things and in this case this sync signal told us everything with this signal only occurring or with only three humps occurring between my two firing events of the same cylinder, that tells us we have three dead cylinders. Now think back for a second. I said we had a one, three, and five misfire on the scan tool, and the back cylinder had one, three, and five. Now I can't get to all the plugs because the intake's in the way. I did take one out. There's no compression on the back cylinder that I checked, and that means there's no compression on the entire back cylinder head. So why does the starter sound so clean? That sound of a relative compression test we've talked about, if you hear an even uniform sound, then that suggests that your compression is good across the board. Why did our sound sound so even and uniform? Because every other cylinder is where this issue is. So compression, no compression, compression, no compression. There should be another hump in here. We, what we should be seeing is another hump in this section from the other cylinder head. So that's why the sound is even even. So now two variables we covered already. One, you can have good, even, uniform humps across the screen and have three dead holes. Two is the sound that we hear can also be variable. And by sound, we said our compression was good. So let me show you what else we did next.
what we did next was compare cam and crank signals together. Now there are four cam sensors on this engine. So just get you a quick shot of where I'm connected. I'm not going to get too detailed here, but there's two cam sensors here. There's two on the back cylinder head and we're grabbing our crank signal right here at the engine computer rather than going underneath the car. And in light of some of the last videos that I've been shooting, in fact, one I haven't done yet, it's on a Honda that you guys will be seeing soon, that we can have our ignition firing event line up and still have our chains be off on our cams. So I showed one on an S10 where we had a completely broken cam or a completely broken chain that still lined up. So again, our thought process here is how about let's do a cam and crank relationship waveform and see if we can find a known good one. I don't have any on the 3.6, but we'll do some digging. We'll go on IETN on the waveform library and uh, see if we can find a good waveform matching what this 3.6 has and let's compare them. So that's, that's where we went next. So let me show you my stored captures of my cam and crank. So again, I'm getting my crank signal at the computer back probe in that connector and I'm getting my intake and exhaust cam sensors on the front head and then I also grabbed intake and exhaust on the back cylinder head. So let me show you those pictures next. Okay, so this is a stored waveform. I'm not going to go through all the motions again and crank it so you can hear it and the procedures for hooking up. I, I hopefully by this point you guys have an idea of what I'm doing. In this capture, this is bank two. We originally did this yesterday with the Varus, which is a fine tool too. I just wanted these pictures in my computer database. So we picked the Pico to, to redo it today because I wanted the captures. And mainly because I can transfer information myself better, just personal preference, with my Pico. Now, of course, we can move things with the Varus too, and I'm not downplaying the Varus, please. I'm, this isn't a sales pitch. So I wanted a good captured waveform. What we're looking at, this is your crank and this is your, I have them marked. I got B is my exhaust cam, so that's my green channel, I'm sorry, my red channel is my exhaust cam and my green channel is my intake cam. And then we have the crank here. And what I can do for you is we'll do 720. We'll do 720 of the crank. And I know that based on these sink notches that are in the crank. And we don't have to go into all the theory and operation here. It's not really what I'm trying to cover. What we're looking at here is our cam crank relationship. Now I still don't have a good picture. I, I did find a few files from some of my friends on IATN and what I found was at idle. Now, I couldn't find any good cranking captures. And this one having variable valve timing, I was a little concerned about a running capture compared to cranking. I, I didn't know how reliable I could use a running capture to compare a cranking capture. But what I found was on this gentleman's pictures that the intake and exhaust cams in this area, let me move this over a little bit to show you. I noticed that in this area, they, they kind of line up with each other. Now the patterns are different, but, but I did notice that these were very, very close. B is the exhaust cam. You see it's a little bit off from the intake cam. And I noticed this same picture on that gentleman's capture. So this is our front cylinder head that we're looking at. So again, I'll give you, a, give you an eyeball here that we can look at these two guys together in this area. Let's look at the back number one. Let's look at the number one cylinder head, see what that one looks like. And this was the capture from the number one. Ignore this. This is my in cylinder pressure. We'll get to that. We didn't do that initially. And again, we're looking in, I'll just get you some of it. We'll just look at these two. We won't worry about the crank right now. And you see the the large square wave areas in here, how they do not line up on this head. They're really not even close to each other. So I do know that there is an issue here with these signals. Now, not knowing enough about the engine, is that enough to say that we have a jump chain? Remember, going into this, 
I'm kind of going out of order here. Going into this, I didn't know that, I'd ha that I had no compression on the back cylinder head. I really assumed incorrectly that compression was good. And what I'm trying to do is to get a test that says with 100% certainty that we need to rip the covers off of this engine and check the chains. And we don't want to guess for something like that. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be accurate so we don't have to guess. And we don't want to spend, imagine spending whatever the job is. I'm, I've never done one on the 3.6. It looks pretty complicated. Let's just hypothetically say, imagine spending six hours of labor pulling that all apart only to find out that that wasn't your problem. I mean, you look at bulletins on this car, there's talks of reprogramming for computers and you know, there's a lot of misdirection that you could take. What are we trying to do? We're trying to develop testing methods that make us accurate. That's what we're doing. Is this enough accuracy here? To me right now, not enough. I can see there's a difference and what, I'm, what I decided to do next was some in-cylinder pressure transducer testing. Now, what we know about this is we can look at a pressure transducer waveform alone without anything else and identify cam timing problems, valve timing problems. I'm not good at it yet, I'm trying, but my attempt is to do that because again, my assumption that my compression's good across the board, that spark is good and lined up to TDC, fuel is good, so I wanna see if my cam is off enough that is gonna cause this thing to be a no start. So I'm gonna do some in cylinder pressure transducer stuff next and then we'll come back to this crank signal and I'll show you the crank related to these two. And, and again, I'm, I'm trying to retrace my steps here for you. It's a little bit difficult to do in which direction I chose to go next. Uh, at this point, I'm confident. I looked at cam and crank. I didn't have enough known good patterns to go by to say whether or not this was a problem or my other side was a problem. So let me show you the in-cylinder ones now. Let's go back to bank two, our, our known good bank. And I, I grabbed this capture. And today I chose to use the Pico. Again, remember, yesterday I used the Varus to do the cam crank signals. Today I chose the Pico because I don't have a real good pressure transducer for my Varus. There is, that is available too, but I use the Pico for this capture and we're looking at our in-cylinder presser on this fourth channel. So my fourth channel, and that was in the picture you saw in the last couple of video shots under the hood, I had my pressure transducer connected to cylinder number four. So cylinder four, we're getting a pressure signal from. And you can see that in here, these pressure waves. And it's actually pretty good uh, in that we're about 162, 160 pounds of compression on that cylinder number four. So we do have compression on the front cylinders. We have spark on the front cylinders. We have fuel. Next thing I did, went to the back cylinder head. This is my compression in the single cylinder I checked in the back. And I had to change my scales. Look, this is a two PSI scale, and I have nothing on this. This is zero, get out of the way here. This is my zero line. There's no compression in here. I can't identify what's what. I don't know where top dead center is here, but there's no compression at all. Once we saw this, and we saw no compression on that back cylinder head, cylinder head number one, bank one, we said to ourselves, how did we have good relative compression readings in our original tests? So we went back and did it. We went back and did this test right here. And I don't have the capture up here. The one I wanted to show you. This is the one, I'm sorry. Forgive me. We went, we did this test, I'm sorry. We did this one right here. I threw the relative compression reading in here. I had the cam and crank already set up. I didn't feel like setting up a trigger for an ignition firing event. We didn't do that yet. I'm, I'm kind of working backwards here. This 
relative compression waveform, what we were now thinking was, as I showed you, that we only have three good cylinders and three dead ones. And here's how we caught it. A little bit of background on the crank sensor. We have a sink notch every 360 degrees of crank rotation we can see here. Uh, the up-down waveform here is just simply from cranking speeds. Uh, it, it's a characteristic of a VRS type input. Speed increases, signal increases. Speed decreases, signal decreases. So ignore that up down. Focus on the sink. This is 360 from here to here. From here to here is 360. And from here to here is another 360. So you see we have 720 right there. So let me zoom in on that. Take this area and zoom in on 720. And how many relative compression humps do we now see? We saw three. And that's when we went back and we threw this picture in here. And this is where we went wrong originally. We weren't focused again here and here. We were only focused on where the timing was occurring. So we missed it. We missed it. Pretty cool capture right there. I wish I would have paid a little bit more attention yesterday when we did this. We wouldn't have spent more time in doing unnecessary troubleshooting. Uh, it's good we caught it. We were very suspicious about the back cylinder head from the get-go or chains from the get-go from a very, very basic test. You know what it was? We just put our hand over the throttle body when we cranked it and we had pressure increases. It was actually pushing our hand off of the throttle body instead of pulling and having good cranking vacuum. So a simple cranking vacuum test on this engine could have identified an issue. It's nice to take it a little further and know exactly where our problem is. It's definitely on our back cylinder head and what we're saying is our chain is off. So I was hoping to maybe do a little comparison here, final thought with this video. Let me show you the comparison with the chains and you guys that have maybe a known good waveform can can uh, you know get one to me and I'll get you my captures and trade off so whatever I mean I'd like to have a known good for this vehicle I do think our front cylinder head is known good but let me show you the comparison okay this part's difficult I'm not sure I can even do this very well because it's kind of hard to see it here on camera <clears throat> but what we do have the ability to do is to look at the sink notches of the crank compare the intake cam compare the exhaust cam. We can do that with both sides. I'll try to do that quickly. Um, let's just look at this area in here. And we'll throw, the, throw this cam in here. This is my exhaust cam is my red trace. My intake cam is my green trace. We'll throw this one in the mix too. And it's kind of hard to see those all together like that, isn't it? Well, let's do, let's do them one at a time. Here's our exhaust cam compared to the crank. Let's go look at the other side. This is our bad cylinder. Uh, let's see if we got a, something key we can look at here. Um, leading edge here, right next to, so this is kind of a fatter pulse here. It is really close to the sink of that crank. So let's look at the other one and see if that's showing that way. Bank, this would be our good bank. Bank two is our good bank. <clears throat> and we'll get this other stuff out of the picture. Just going to focus on this red trace, which we said is our exhaust. Take a look at this. I'm zoomed in a little bit more than I was before, but we're pretty close. The fat part of that exhaust cam, we're real close to that sink nod. So it looks like our exhaust cams are, are pretty close. Let, let's look at our intake cam now. Pull this red trace out of here, and we'll look at our intake cam. This is our, our known good cil cylinder, or our known good uh, bank, and we'll get 720 of it again. We'll look in kind of this area and kind of eyeball here what we have. The second of the two 
bigger notches. We are, we can, we can actually look at this. We'll, we'll go from here, the leading edge to the sink notch. I'm actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven teeth from that, from that leading edge. We have our sink notch on the crank. This is our intake cam on our good side. So remember that, seven teeth. Let's see where the other one's at. Bank one is our bad bank. Our green trace is our intake cam. Pull our intake cam up into here. And we'll look at 720 again. Get this one out of the picture. And check it out. This is totally different. What I said is the leading edge, which would be this. Let me kind of put this in the same location here. That was kind of where we were. The leading edge of this bigger pulse was seven teeth off from this sink notch, and this one's right on. <coughs> so my intake cam is off on bank one compared to bank two. Now without a known good waveform, you still might not know that. So it took a combination of all of our tests together to really make this call. And you know, there are some easier ways to do things. Uh, I'm showing procedures. We want to have as many procedures as possible. Uh, if you think about different tools you have in your toolbox, there's a tool that's gonna work great on one car and it's not gonna work on another. So what do we need? We need other tools that can do that job. So that's really what we're trying to do. Develop methods that we can identify problems, test the methods that we've been taught, test them ourselves in a good, Final thought for this is the variables again with the relative compression test. Using that relative compression test alone would have caused misdiagnosis here. You would have thought that all the cylinders had compression. So combining that with that cylinder firing event was key. Doing some further tests, looking at cam and crank, some in-cylinder pressure, regular compression tests, all of this contributed to making the right call on this, which is, I think the next step is the chains, the covers need to come off and we need to do an inspection. And then also we have to be concerned about bent valves. Now I don't know if being seven teeth off on the intake cam is enough to bend the valves. It's definitely enough to give me no compression. We know that. Uh, I guess the other thing too is we really don't know if we're exactly seven teeth off. I could be off on what I'm calling my known good cylinder head could be off, but it does look a lot, a lot alike. It does look a lot like the capture that I saw from one of my friends on IATN. So I think we're comfortable. This is what we're going to call on this vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be tearing this down. This is going to actually go back to the garage. They wanted us to troubleshoot it for them. But I can now say to this garage who brought us this car with 100% certainty to go ahead and pull the covers off and do inspections on the chains. And, and really that's what this is all about.